The uniqueness of the farm is that we couldn't leave. The farm was what Wayne was really struggling with and yet we live on farm. He would sit on the couch and all he could see was the jobs he wasn't getting done on the farm. Thank you, right, can everyone hear me? I'm Tyler Langford. Um, I actually grew up half an hour south in the metropolis of Invercargill. My story is about what it's like to be a, the partner um, when your other half is suffering from depression. It was the most harrowing experience I've ever had. Um, you know, to watch your best friend literally disappear before your eyes is horrendous. Up, 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 up. Yeah, the Langfords have been in Golden Bay for, for generations. I think I'm sixth generation. My sons will be uh, seventh. I grew up um, about uh, three kilometres down the road. Uh, grew up on the family farm and was pretty, pretty heavily involved with the farm there. It's been a really good year. I'm kind of saying if this is El Nino, I'll have it every year, thanks. Yeah. I absolutely married into farming. When I came to visit Wayne the first time, he asked me to go get some kindling out of the woodshed. And I went out there and I came back and said, oh, there's no kindling. And he came back and said, well, just chop some. And I looked at him and said, what, with like a real ax? So we brought this farm in 2015. We were 32. We had a, a six, a seven, and an eight-year-old. We went through two really tough years of payout, and then two years of, of real, really dry summers. Yeah, well, I, I guess uh, 2017 was, was when it really all kind of uh, folded in on itself. Um, yeah, uh, like I say, um, we, we'd had a you know, we'd been through a, a, a couple of a tough years, um, but it was just uh, when I look back on it now, it wasn't it wasn't just that that, that did it, you know. Like it was a bit of bit of everything, I think. And eventually, it was just the smallest thing that that, that broke the camel's back. He would come home and he'd basically just go to bed. He'd crawl into bed, and that probably was his safe place, and he'd stay there. Um, he definitely wasn't verbalising you know, his struggles. Um, obviously it was clear to see, at least from my point of view, that he was struggling um, and clear for the boys to see. I come from a family where it's like suck it up buttercup. So um, initially I sort of, he was struggling and I was like, oh, you'll be right, you'll be right, you'll be right, she'll be right. Um, and it probably wasn't till it happened month on month on month. Um, and then he started to miss some really, uh, what you call it, obvious crucial decisions on farm that probably had come really easy to him previously. Looking back on it now, I can hand on heart say that he had depression, but at the time, I think even I struggled to put the words around what it was. I couldn't get him to call Rural Support Trust, as amazing as I think the organisation is. I couldn't get him to call it, I couldn't get him to go to a GP. Um, he literally thought they were gonna put him in a straitjacket and take him away from his kids and his farm. He was paralysed by the feelings that he was having. I remember I did everything I could at that stage to uh, to probably uh, to push her away and and uh, and to you know to push the kids away. And... The longest walk of my life was from our bedroom where I would leave Wayne, who wouldn't get out of bed again, and I would have ten steps to get to our lounge where I had three boys at the time who were quite little, looking at me like, "Tell us everything's going to be okay. Just just tell us it's all going to be okay." There was plenty of days where I thought, I'll just put the kids in the car and drive. And that wasn't, that wasn't because I wanted to leave Wayne or I wanted to, that was just because the situation was just getting unbearable for me. How do you help someone who is struggling? So I think for everybody it's different. I think the first thing is to try and get them to see that they're struggling. So, um, you know, try and get them to see that what's happening for them is outside of their realm of norm because I don't like the word normal but outside of their realm of the norm. People give you advice like you know give them an ultimatum you know jump up and down and say unless you start making changes I'm going to walk out the door and um, 
Look, I would never be one to tell anyone what they do with their own lives, but I knew for me, and I knew Wayne, that that, that just wouldn't work. Um, he needed someone to stay, you know, by his side um, and work through it with him. Yeah, I remember laying in bed on my 34th birthday. It was, it was one of those things where you feel like you're, you're looking down on yourself saying, hey, you know, got to get, got to get yourself out of this. And so swung my feet round, put them on the floor, and, and we headed off to the beach for my birthday. Um, had, a, had an awesome day at the beach and just, just got that, uh, that zing back in you. And, you know, Wayne looked at me with sort of tears in his eyes and he says, you know, we need to do something like this every day. And then from there, he just started doing little things. He went to meetings, he chatted to a lot of people, he called friends that he hadn't called in ages. You can hear country rugby in the background. Um, I say senior B rugby saved Wayne's life. Um, he went there, he didn't make a tackle in three years. I'm not quite sure what he did on the field. But it was the only place he could go, and he wasn't a father, and he wasn't a farmer, and he could just show up. You know, when Wayne started struggling, the boys say, you know, like they felt like they lost their captain fun. And when he started doing the YOLO journeys, they felt like they were getting their captain fun back. The struggles didn't happen overnight. It was like these slow fogs that creep in over the valley. So we slowly lost bits of Wayne, bit by bit. And the recovery part was really like peeling that fog back, you know. Has he always been a bit of a chef? <laughs> I don't know if I'd say a chef, but he's always liked food. Um, no, the real truth is, is that unless I cook, uh, it's burnt. Yeah, so. that's, that's pretty true. <laughs> so, How do you feel right now? <laughs> Does it seem a long time ago you guys were struggling? Uh, in a way, yes, but it does stay with you. Wayne always calls it our worst, greatest blessing. So not something you'd ever wish on anyone, but created a family philosophy and a cohesiveness that we um, could have never had through any other experience. He still has days like that. It's just he now knows he's got the tools in his toolbox. He knows what he needs to do to move himself back up that spectrum. Yeah. All of the things that he didn't have at the time, um, he's got those now. Because now I'd actually say he has more stresses. He's president of Ferro Farmers. But he just has more tools as well. Yeah, uh, this feeling, this uh, this rawness and emotion will never go away. And I, and I think, to be fair, it's a it's a it's a fair strength that drives me. Uh, but on the other hand, don't take me wrong. You uh, you can pull yourself out of it and uh, and come out the other side and, and actually uh, kind of turn that weakness into a strength. There is no words in the English vocabulary for what you go through in that journey and you know, watching your best friend disappear before your eyes is soul destroying. Mm. Um, but watching them come back into this whole different growth and version of this person is is just equally as incredible and, and hard to put into words. I said people, I got Wayne 2.0 and didn't even have to get divorced. <laughs> hey.